Were we created or did we come from gorillas? Monkeys. Alicia said, I don't know about your family. You are my family. What are you talking about? We were watching a video in my office on the size of the universe. And I, I, I like this kind of stuff because it, it makes the Bible, I, whatever science comes up with, if it's factual, if it's true, to me it just makes this Bible right. And um, they were talking about the size of the universe. Now, the size of the observable universe, how far into space we can see. The Hubble telescope um, that we put in space, the reason why we put a telescope in space is to not have the clouds and the dirty atmosphere cluttering up the image. So we're in open space and we can see farther. And so they're able to see, the farthest they're able to see is some 14 billion light years away on either side. They said that's the observable universe. But the theory is that that is just a minuscule part of the overall universe. And if the universe is in fact that big, it boggles the mind, first of all. And, hi, how you doing? And then it makes what God said, as, as high as the heavens are above the earth, so are my thoughts above your thoughts and my ways above your ways. So literally in the, it, the biggest that you can possibly fathom the universe being, God's above every bit of that. And for all the things, for God who manages everything that goes on in the universe. If an asteroid hits a planet, okay, or an asteroid bumps into another asteroid, God was in control of that. God manages and supervises the entire universe, as big as it is, okay? Because the Bible says the eyes of the Lord are in every place. That means every place. So God knows everything that goes on. And for God then to put his thoughts on me, that's big. What is man that thou art mindful of him? Thou hast made him a little lower than the angels. And so with all the things that go on in the, in the knowable universe, for God to hear me when I pray and to actually care about me when I pray and to care about what I care about, that's big for me. That is a big deal. All the things that God could put his mind on at any given time, and yet he puts his mind on all of mankind. All of every, and that's lost or saved. Every man is on God's mind continuously. That's a blessing. Um, and the reason why I bring this up, we're not, we did not evolve. We did not evolve from a lower life form. We did not, we are not the product of millions of years of accidents that should have never happened. We're not that. We are the product of God's special creation. And that has a lot to do with what I'm going to talk about tonight. Tur turn your Bible to Acts 28. And um, we, one of the, every morning they uh, blow a whistle and call all the workers, the adult workers, to the cafeteria and we have a workers meeting. Used to be at 8 o'clock at this camp. They changed it to 7.30. What an idiot did that. I don't know. But anyway, uh, I wasn't in favor of that, but I, I dealt with it. 
So 7.30, we had this meeting, and this, um, the guy who was running the camp uh, this week, Brother James Fox, did an outstanding, week, uh, outstanding job. But he gave this as, I think, one of the morning's verses, and I just latched on to that. I, I immediately just grabbed a hold of that, and um, I thought, you know, that would be a good, a, a good study to do, and we might as well do it on Sunday night. And what we're going to do is we're going to look at Jesus before Jesus, okay? We're going to look at Jesus before Matthew 1. So in every place in the Old Testament, you're going to find the Lord. He's there. He's, he's there hidden, but He's there. He's there in shadow, but He's there. His, his shadow is there. Uh, his spirit is there. His appearance is there. His work is there. His voice is there. Uh, his judgment is there. Everything about Jesus is there in the Old Testament. You just got to know where to look and you got to know what to look for. So we're going to start out with, we're going to start out in the beginning. We're going to look at Adam tonight. Uh, Acts chapter 28. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, I thank you, Lord, for this day. I thank you, dear God, for uh, your blessing. I thank you for these people that have come out. I pray, Lord, that you would richly bless them in their life. I pray, dear God, that, uh, Lord, every prayer, that every need that they have, that you would meet, that you would answer it. Father, that you, you would give favor to those that uh, have come into your presence tonight, and uh, both here and online. And I pray, dear God, that you would uh, be glorified in them, use them in a great and a mighty way. I pray, dear God, that, uh, Lord, that through their life, uh, others... Other lives would be touched. Other people, Lord, would be reached. Uh, things, Father, that need to be done would be done, Lord. And I pray, dear God, that you would just lay a special blessing upon us tonight as we study your word. And Father, open up our eyes, open up our heart, give us understanding, and help us to understand, Lord, the things that have been, the things that are, and the things that shall be. And Lord, just give us knowledge, give us understanding. Give us wisdom, and Lord, we need a lot of wisdom in the days that we're living in right now. So, Father, we ask for that, and only you can do that for us, and we ask for your favor tonight. We pray this in Jesus' name, and all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. Acts chapter 28, let's start in verse 17, that's what I have up on the screen, uh, really, but I'm kind of setting up the context of verse 23. And verse 17, it says, And it came to pass that after three days Paul called the chief of the Jews together, and when they were come together, he said unto them, Men and brethren, though I have committed nothing against the people or customs of our fathers, yet was I delivered prisoner from Jerusalem into the hands of the Romans, who, when they had examined me, would have let me go, because there was no cause of death in me. But when the Jews spake against it, I was constrained to appeal unto Caesar, not that I had ought to accuse my nation of. For this cause, therefore, have I called for you to see you and to speak with you, because that for the hope of Israel I am bound with this chain. And this is pretty much at the end of Paul's life. He's making one last appeal to uh, his brothers, the, the Israelites. And they, in verse 21, And they said unto him, We neither received letters out of Judea concerning thee, neither any of the brethren that came uh, shewed or spake any harm of thee, but we desire to hear of thee what thou thinkest. For as concerning this sect, we know that everywhere it is spoken against. And he's talking about Christianity. That, my friends, should be a badge of honor. When the world speaks evil, especially if you have done nothing wrong, what they say about you, they are saying about Jesus. Okay? What they say about you, they're saying about Jesus. So everywhere it is spoken against. Verse 23, And when they had appointed him a day, there came many to him in, unto his lodging, to whom he expounded and testified the kingdom of God. And then here it is. Persuading them concerning Jesus. Both out of the law of Moses. And out of the prophets. From morning until evening. So here's what he did. What he had was the Old Testament. He had Genesis through Malachi. And he was given this day. And he spent all day long. Morning, all noon, afternoon, into the evening, he spent this entire day 
Sounds like homecoming, okay? We have the whole day to just study the Word of God. And from morning until evening, Paul, using only the Old Testament, he expounded Jesus to them. He taught them Jesus and who he was using only the Old Testament. So that tells us then that Jesus makes these appearances all throughout the pages of the Old Testament. And what it takes is, it takes a New Testament mind. It takes someone who has the Spirit of God in them to be able to, and knowledge, Paul had knowledge. He, even though the New Testament hadn't been uh, all written yet, book of Revelation hasn't been written, Paul, we would assume by the end of his life, he's written everything he's going to write. But it hadn't been codified yet. It hadn't been put into a book form yet. So Paul has the knowledge of the New Testament, even if they don't have the books of it. But he's, he's giving knowledge of Jesus Christ all throughout Moses and all of the prophets. Moses being the first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. It's called the Pentateuch. And then you have all of the, the kingdom books where it talks about the kings. Then you have the Psalms, Proverbs. Then you have the prophets. And he uses all of that to expound and to teach Jesus. So let's take this time and let's look at Jesus through the character of Adam. Turn to Luke chapter 3. Luke chapter 3. Uh, for years, I never knew this existed until I read this one day and it, I, just, I just about fell out of my chair. Um, the lineage, there's two different places in the New Testament that gives the lineage of Jesus. We're going to take a look at both of those. But for this one here, we're going to start out in verse 23. Uh, this is uh, in Luke 3. This is when Jesus was uh, baptized by John the Baptist. And he comes out of the water. Verse 22, the Holy Ghost descends upon him and God says, Thou art my beloved son and thee am I am, I am well pleased. And so verse 23, it says, And Jesus himself began to be about 30 years of age, being as was supposed the son of Joseph, which was the son of Heli, which was the son of Mathat, which was the son of Levi, which was the son of Melchi. And we can, I'm not going to read all these because there's 77 names here. That number is significant, I think. But if you go on down the list, we pick it up in verse 37 which was the son of Methuselah, which was the son of Enoch, which was the son of Jared, which was the son of Malaleel, which was the son of Canaan, which was the son of Enos, which was the son of Seth, which was the son of Adam, which was, look at what your Bible says. The Bible's calling Adam the son of God. So right here, we're getting a picture. We're getting a typological picture that Adam is a prototype. He is a foreshadowing. Adam's life himself is a prophecy of Jesus. Now, just an interesting little piece of information here, that if you notice in verse 23, it says, Jesus himself began to be about 30 years of age. The number of times Adam is mentioned in your King James Bible, you want to take a guess? 30. Exactly 30 times Adam is mentioned in the King James Bible. So Adam is given the title of the son of God. So he is a foreshadowing of Jesus Christ. Now, we go to Matthew, the other um, genealogy of Jesus. Matthew chapter 1, turn there. We have a, a different genealogy. In Luke 3, it's going from Jesus backwards all the way to Adam. In Matthew, it's starting with Abraham. It starts with Abraham and moves forward down to Jesus. All right, I don't know exactly why. I just, I believe both records are accurate. So we have in Matthew chapter 1, verse 1, the book of the generation of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Now, I've pointed this out before in several teachings I've done. This is the first occurrence in the New Testament of the word book. It's like a gene, it's like a book of genealogy or a book of records. Like in old Bibles, old family Bibles, you'll find 
a, a, a genealogy there. It starts out with whoever owns the Bible and they trace their ancestors back to so on and so on and so on. That's what you have here in the Bible. The first Old Testament occurrence of the word book is in Genesis chapter 5. So turn to Genesis chapter 5. And it says virtually the same thing. Matthew chapter 1, verse 1, it says the book of the generation of Jesus Christ. The word generation gives us the idea of genetics. Gene, the word genealogy. That word is based upon the word Genesis. Genesis means the beginning, the origins of everything. So in a genealogy or with genetics or with genet generations, you're looking at the origins. And this is why I started out saying we did not evolve from monkeys. We did not evolve from lizards. We did not evolve from little specks of goo in a pool of goo 14 million years ago that was struck by lightning. And all of a sudden a cell was formed with amino acids and DNA and all the working parts of a cell. They say just... Generated just like that. Boom. Just like that, Mike. The first cell, which had to have had a cell wall, mitochondria, because that's the fuel, that's what burns sugar to give the cell energy. It had to have a nucleus. It had to have DNA. The very first cell had to have at least these four things here, or it could not have survived much less couldn't have divided itself and turned into two cells. To, for them to convince me evolution is true, you've got to convince me that in one second, the first working cell was formed accidentally. You'll never convince me of that. That's the stupidest thing I've ever heard of in my life. Every, look around you. This did not just show up by evolution on our communion table. Amen? We did not wait 14 million years in this church for this to show up here. This was made. The material that it comes from was manufactured. It was pulled up out of the ground. Where did it come from in the ground? God put it there. Okay? Everything around us is manufactured, is made with a design to it. The universe was made by a design. How is it that one galaxy, 14 billion light years over here, has the exact same mathematical spiral as another galaxy 14 billion light years this way? How is it that those two things have the exact same design? It had, it had a designer. So, we did not come about by accident. We did not come about by uh, a, a series of evolution. No matter how long that would have taken, that's not how it happened. We had a, we had a genesis. We had an origin. There was one day, there was no man. And the next day, there was man. So, first occurrence of the word book in the Old Testament. Genesis chapter 5, verse 1. This is the book of the generations of Adam. Now, the Bible's giving you these similarities here. Because it's telling you that Adam is a foreshadow of Jesus. That, that we have one man in the Old Testament. We have one man in the New Testament. And that's going to come into play here in in a little bit i'm not saying in a short while it's just i'm going to i'm going to get to that eventually but notice this in genesis 5 verse 1 this is the book of the generations of adam and the day that god created man and the likeness of god made he him male and female created he them and blessed them and called their name adam this is why the lady takes the man's name it's right there in your bible god created adam and he created the woman and he joined them together and he called them adam does anybody know what the name Adam means? Anybody? It's related to the word Edom. Edom was Esau's name. Okay? Edom and Adam have the same 
Genesis, I guess. Adam literally means red like the dirt. How did God make man? Out of the dirt. And what color is he on the inside? He's red. He's red. Every man, every human, no matter what color on the outside, on the inside, they're all red. Their blood is red. Their organs and tissues, because they have blood running to them, they also are red, just like the earth that we're made out of. So then in verse 5, And all the days that Adam lived were 930 years, and he died. You've heard me make this connection before, but here we have Adam, 930 years. That's how long he lived. And Matthew chapter 1 is the 930th chapter of the Bible. It takes you from the first Adam, literally, and he dies. Now we have the second Adam, which of course is Jesus Christ. Now here's, a turn to Genesis chapter 1. Because we see that Adam, and this is pretty cool, Adam was made in the image of God. Do we really believe that? Absolutely, you have to. That's what God said. And again, if you want to try to jam evolution into this, then you have to say that God at one time looked like a monkey. Because God clearly, when he made Adam, he made Adam in God's own image. To ask the question, does God have eyes? The answer, of course, is yes, because man has eyes. That's not, we learned this word in Bible college, anthropomorphism. It's the idea that says that God doesn't really look like this. He just made these analogies so that we would understand God a little bit better if we had a visualization of him. But God doesn't really look like us. And I don't agree with that. The anthro means man. Promorphism means God has changed into the image of man. And so their, their theory is that God uses these words to describe himself, but he, that's not who, really who he is. Well, then God's lying. So I think God's telling the truth. I think in Genesis 1 verse 26, God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. This was preached at camp this week. Who is God talking to? Very good. She listened. Okay. Now, I read a book when I was in high school by Eric Von Daniken called Chariots of the Gods. And Von Daniken read this and said that the space aliens that dropped us here on this planet, this is them in their council chambers talking in the UFO that's hovering over the earth that they're going to put this man creature on this planet and see what he does with it. That was his theory, because he's reading this and going, obviously God's not, you know, talking to himself. Well, yeah, he is. Let us make man in our image after our likeness. What do you got? He says it three times. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. You have it three times again. For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. These three are one. And so you have God saying to himself, let us... Make man in our image after our likeness. In the image of God the Father, the image of God the Son, the image of God's Holy Spirit. So man has, number one, his body, his flesh. That is what Jesus became. The Word became flesh. Man has his soul which is his inner being, that's the Holy Spirit, and man has a spirit. The Bible says God is spirit, okay? So literally, the substance of man is spirit, soul, and body, and this matches God the Father, God the Spirit, and God the Son. Literally, we are made in the image of God. So, let's read this verse completely. And God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let them, so now he's speaking of mankind, plural, as a species. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, 
and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. Now, if we were to stop right here, and I don't have this in my notes, but if I, if I thought about it, I would have. What this, what this is a picture of is that one of these days, and I believe soon, Christ, the second Adam, is going to descend down from heaven. He's going to put his feet on the earth, and he's going to declare, this is mine. He's going to take Satan, he's going to bound him for a thousand years, throw him in the pit, chain him up for a thousand years, and Christ literally is going to rule over all that he... Satan is no longer going to be the God of this world. Amen. Jesus is going to be in control. But for now, we, man, has dominion over the earth. Do not let the New Agers, do not let the earth worshipers, the Gaia worshipers, don't let Al Gore or anybody else tell you that man is an invasive, cancerous species on the planet. God gave us dominion, which means that if we want to kill cockroaches, we can. If we want to kill squirrels and eat them, we can. If we want to farm for vegetables, we can do that. Man has been given the right to own parts of this earth. Amen? Socialism, communism, protest fiercely against private ownership of anything. And yet as proof that God gives you as an individual person ownership of something on this earth, God has a commandment called thou shalt not steal. Meaning that if it belongs to Sterling, then it belongs to Sterling and nobody else has a right to just arbitrarily take it away from him with no cause whatsoever. Amen? That is God giving man dominion over I mean, who likes to go fishing? You have the right. You have the dominion over it. Listen, if you can catch them, catch them. Okay? You have dominion over the fish of the sea. Who likes to eat chicken? Fowl of the air. Who likes to eat steak and hamburgers and beef hot dogs? Cattle. Over all the earth. Who likes to own land? Have property. Over all the earth. Who eats snakes and bugs? Go for it. <laughs> Over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. Well, see, that in itself is a picture of Christ, the second Adam, who's going to have dominion over everything. But the idea here is that we, man, Adam, the first Adam, was made in the image of God. Now take your Bible, turn to 2 Corinthians 4. If you turn fast, I'll preach fast. Okay? 2 Corinthians 4. Verse 4. In whom the God of this world, being Satan, hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light... That would be uh, Bill Nye the science guy. Bill Nye the science guy, to me, represents all of secular humanistic science that does not believe in God and thinks people are stupid who believe in God. This man is an idiot. This man is willfully ignorant of the fact that he is a special creation of God being given not only a chance at life on this earth, but being given a living soul directly from the nostrils of God. Bill Nye, the science guy, breathes God's air with God's permission. And he doesn't recognize God. So he's blinded. He believes not. Lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the, look at here, Christ who is the image of God, should shine unto them. Remember what Jesus said to his disciples? If you've seen me, what have you seen? Seen the Father. We can't, right now, we can't see God. We cannot see God. We'll die. The closest that we can come is to look upon Jesus. Now, we didn't live when Jesus walked the earth. What then... Are we able to see of both Jesus and God? The Bible. This, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. This is the only image allowed of God. I was going to preach on idolatry this morning. There are no statues of Jesus. 
There are no statues of Mary. There are no statues of Moses or John the Baptist or Peter or Paul. We don't do that. We don't have images. We don't pray to them. We don't bow to them. And if you think only Roman Catholics do that, you're wrong. I went to a Lutheran church. I went to a funeral at a Lutheran church in this county. And I sat there and there was a big 10 foot tall Jesus statue sitting on a throne up on the stage. And I'm just going, uh, I don't know if that's right or not. And then when I saw the Lutheran priest walk in reading a prayer, walk up to the stage, reading the prayer to the statue, I went, nah, I'm sorry, nah, you're not supposed to do that. Okay, that's, that's an abomination. I felt bad. The fam- I love the family. They lost their son. I love that family. They were good people as far as morals and getting things done in Jefferson City on family values and things like that. But they were deceived into believing that, that they, could be, they could be praying to this statue. That's nuts. That's crazy. The image of God that we have is this book. And I know that's kind of bizarre to think, but Jesus is the Word. What I see of Jesus, I see right here in the pages of the Bible. So Jesus is the image of God, should shine unto them. Colossians 1.15 Christ, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. Now think about that. He's talking about, he's making a reference to Adam. Adam, of course, was the first living man ever made. Christ is the firstborn of every creature. And Christ is the image of the God that we cannot see, the invisible God. Christ is the image of that. If somebody, Matthew, if somebody says... Show me, uh, show me God. Show me a factual evidence that there is a God. Give him a Bible. And then read John 1, 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. You see, well, I won't get into that. Everything in creation has a design to it. A design is a matrix or instructions on how to make something. And that's what this, I believe the Bible is a literal, um, literal science textbook on how everything in the universe works. I don't understand it all, but I believe it. That's what I, if God spoke this world and this universe into existence, His Word is right here before us, and there's something about the mechanics of everything in the universe that I think is in the Bible. Colossians 3.10, have put on the new man, which is, notice that, the old, we, we are Adam, the first Adam. You and I are Adam. We're of the earth, we're red like the clay, the dirt, and we are the offspring of the first Adam. The first Adam sinned, right? The second Adam sinned. Did not. So in order for us to have eternal life, we must shed off the first Adam and take hold of the second Adam. The first Adam sinned, does not inherit the kingdom of God. The second Adam did not sin. Think about it. Where Adam failed, Christ achieved. Adam failed when he ate the fruit that God said, do not eat. So when the serpent then goes to Jesus to tempt him like he did Eve. He tempts him three ways. Eve, Eve was tempted three ways. Jesus was tempted yet without sin. Jesus accomplished what the first Adam was incapable of accomplishing. And put on the new man which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. So in order for us to have eternal life, we already bear the image of the first Adam, which is made in the image of God. We must then also bear the image of the second Adam in order to have eternal life. We bear the image of the first Adam to have life here. We bear the image of the second Adam in order to have life in the new heavens and the new earth. Turn to 1 Corinthians 15. There's a lot here in 1 Corinthians 15. It's a beautiful, one of my favorite. It is one 
among several of my favorite chapters in the whole Bible. 1 Corinthians 15 is loaded with doctrine, symbolism, prophecy, typology, you name it, it's there. 1 Corinthians 15, 47. The first man is of the earth, earthy. And remember, what, is, what does the word Adam mean? What does the name mean? Eat and and I've mentioned that Adam and Edom are the same, same words, same names. Why did they call Esau Edom? He was ruddy. He was a red-headed, furry beast. That's what he was. Esau is a type of the old man who loses the inheritance. Jacob is a type of the new man who gets the inheritance. Think about it. Okay, the first man is of the earth, earthy. And so think about it. Who was born first, Esau or Jacob? Esau was. But Esau doesn't get, the firstborn doesn't get the inheritance. The secondborn does. That's why he did it that way. The first man is of the earth, earthy. The second man is the Lord from heaven. Notice that the separation, the difference between them. Verse 48, as is the earthy, such are they also that are earthy. So do you think you would have done any different than Adam did in the Garden of Eden? Nope. You would have made the same mistake. You would have, and that's manifest because Adam only had one law to obey. And he blew it. We've got ten. And we've practically blown every one of those too. Okay? So we wouldn't, we wouldn't have been any different in the garden than Adam was. We inherited who he was. So as is the earthy, such are they also that are earthy. As is the heavenly, such are they also that are heavenly. Verse 49 is the key. As we have borne the image of the earthy, first Adam, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly, the second Adam. That means whatever Jesus looks like when he comes back, we're going to look like he does. Glorious. Absolutely glorious. We're going to shine brighter than the sun. That's what we're going to do. We're going to shine that way. Won't that be great? Now, Adam the husband. I like this. Turn to, turn to Genesis 2. Turn to Genesis 2. I already start doing these Bible sword drills when I tell you to go to these places. Charge. Genesis 2. Charge. Genesis 2, verse 18. And the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be a note. Now, here's what I want you to do. I want you to think Jesus. When you're reading this about Adam, I want you to think Jesus. Adam is the son of God. The Bible says it in the exact words. Adam, who is the son of God. So Adam is playing the part of Jesus, the son of God. And when God says to Adam, it is not good that the man should be alone. Who is he really saying that to? Jesus, his son. Why, why the church? Why, does, why did God ordain the church. Why does God call us sinners to repentance to be part of the church? It is because God is preparing a bride for his son. We are, are the wife, the engaged wife, the betrothed wife of Jesus Christ. That's our purpose. That's who we are. And just as, in, just as in any marriage, if two people hate each other, should they get married? Sometimes they do. They shouldn't. It's like the guy said after his fourth divorce, he said, I'm not going to get married anymore ever again. I'm just going to go out every three or four years, find a woman I hate and buy her a house. Save him a lot of trouble. Jesus only wants the bride 
that loves him. Not of woman that hates him. He only wants the bride that freely chooses and freely loves Jesus with all their heart, all their soul, all their mind. He doesn't want a wife that doesn't want him back. That's the most miserable thing to have in the world. Amen? So it is not good that the man should be alone. I will make an help meet for him. We, we put these two words together and say help meet, but it's a help meet. Meet meaning sufficient for his needs. Um, where he is incomplete, she makes him complete, is what that means. So, verse 22, notice this, notice how God did it. The rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he a woman and brought her unto the man. And Adam said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. Now I want you to picture what's happening here. The Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam. What does sleep symbolize in the Bible? Death. Think Jesus. Was that a is that a cricket? I thought I heard a cricket. Think Jesus and his death. Okay? And then what did God do to Adam? What part of his body did he get it from? A rib. So now Adam was wounded. God performed the first surgery under anesthesia ever. Because he put Adam in a deep sleep and did surgery on him. Took his rib out. Okay? So, think about it. In John chapter 19, what happened to Christ when he's on the cross? One of the soldiers with a spear pierced what? His side. Probably right here. My guess is he pierced the pericardium, the call around the heart. That sack of water... So that in piercing both the pericardium and the heart, blood and water issues forth from Jesus. And there came out blood and water. And he that saw it bear record, and his record is true. And he knoweth that he saith true, that ye might believe. For these things were done, that the scripture should be fulfilled. A bone of him should not be broken. And again another scripture saith, they shall look on him whom they pierced. So here is a wound in Adam's side that God uses to make the wife of Adam. Here's a wound in Jesus' side that because of the blood and the water issuing forth, those both are testifying to our redemption and our salvation. It was the wound and the piercing of Jesus that causes us to be the wife of Jesus Christ. Can I hear somebody say amen? That's a beautiful picture of it. A wound in Adam's side brings about his bride. A wound in the side of Jesus brings about his bride. Now, we look at Ephesians chapter 5. Turn there. This is Adam was the first husband. Christ is the husband of those who are the firstborn of the church. Ephesians 5.25 Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave Himself for it. Husbands, that's how we're supposed to be to our wives. Can I hear some guys say amen? That it might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the Word. That He might present it to Himself a glorious church. Think about God in, in a marriage ceremony. I will, this, this is how I do it, this is how I was, I've seen it done. I will come out and me and the groom will stand here. The bride is back yonder 
and is brought in by her father. Are you catching this? This is God. The father represents God giving the bride to his son, Adam. So I say, who giveth this woman to be married to this man? And the daddy says, her mother and I, or sometimes it's just I. But I, I'm the one doing this. And God is the one bringing us to our husband, Jesus Christ. God did not fail to give Adam his wife, Eve. God will not fail to give Jesus his bride, the church. Somebody say amen. That he might present it to himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. Adam even recognized it. He that loveth his wife loveth himself, for no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth it and cherisheth it, even as the Lord the church, if you've ever, Chris, if you've ever hit your hand with a hammer, have you ever hit your thumb with a hammer? Once? Twice? Yeah, in the day? Wham! And what we do is we care less about the hammer then. We drop the hammer. Hold that. That's instinctive in us. Anytime we wound ourselves, we immediately go because we cherish this flesh. It's instinctive in us, in every one of us. As soon as we are harmed, we immediately go to try to cover wherever the wound is. And here is Jesus, the husband, who cherishes his bride, the church. And I promise you, whenever any one of us are hurting, He's right there to minister comfort and aid because he cherishes his body, which is us. Isn't this good? For we are members. Well, let, me, let me read verse 29 again. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it, even as the Lord, the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this cause shall a man, who's the man? Jesus. Leave his father and mother. Who's his father? God. Shall be joined unto his wife. So Jesus is going to leave the right hand of the Father, He's going to come all the way, billions and billions and billions and trillions of light years through space in a moment. That's a fast spaceship. In a moment, He's going to appear in the clouds. We're going to be caught up to Him like the joining together of a husband and a wife. And she'll be joined into His wife. And they too shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. 2 Corinthians 11. I've been teaching on this in Sunday school for a year. Would to God you could bear with me a little on my folly and indeed bear with me, for I am jealous over you with godly jealousy. For I have espoused to you, espoused you to one husband that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. So here's why I want you to think about this. And I'm, gonna, I'm not done with this, but I'm going to cut it off here. I'm close to being done, but I'm not done. And the rest of it I want to spend some time with. How many women did Adam have to choose from? He only had one. He only had 24 ribs, but God only took one of them. So that leaves Adam with how many ribs? 23 is the number for death. Okay? It's the number for crucifixion. Death. 
All right? That's cool. I think that's cool. How many, in reality, how many women does Jesus have to choose from? There's only one church. There's only one bride. There's only one group of people that by their own free will you have chosen to love Jesus. You've chosen Him. You love Him. You depend on Him. You need Him. He, in turn, desires His bride. He has called us and no other. He has washed us and sanctified us and has set His love upon us and no other. Jesus is never going to step out on His church. Likewise, His church is only going to consist of those who don't step out on Him. See, Jesus was betrothed to Israel in the Old Testament. But, and think about the duality here. Adam had his wife Eve, but she failed him. Did she not? She was the one to first eat the fruit. And then she gave it to Adam. You know what that's a picture of? The Bible said of Christ that he tasted death for every man. Christ took on death willingly for the sake of his wife. That's beautiful. But God was betrothed to Israel in the Old Testament. And repeatedly, she stepped out on him. Over and over and over and over again. Until finally, God said, Here's your divorce papers. I'm done. I'm going to go and I'm going to find me a wife that actually loves me, that wants me. And he found you and he found me. Okay? Now, we may not be the best looking, okay? But we are going to be made glorious by Jesus Christ. And you, ladies, you remember what you wore when you were married. It's beautiful. I would say no woman would ever do this, but in today's world, it's anything goes. No woman would ever wear a pair of camouflage shorts, camo tube top to her wedding. Normally. Normally. We, it has been granted that we should be arrayed in fine linen, white and clean, which is Christ adorning us with His righteousness. He paid for the dress, ladies. He paid for the dress with His own blood. He paid for that dress. Amen? There's a lot more to this. If, if you want homework, study Romans 5. There's your homework for next Sunday night. Okay? Because I'm going to talk about Romans 5. It's one man here and then one man here. As one man did this, so one man does that. Okay? Thank you for coming. Let's stand to our feet. Father, we thank you for this evening.
I thank you, Lord, for your blessing. Thank you, Lord, for your Son, Jesus Christ. Thank you for putting us in it, putting it, putting it in our hearts to love Jesus. I love him. I love him with all my heart. And I'm thankful and grateful that I get to be part of the body of Jesus Christ. Whatever part to me is insignificant. It doesn't matter to me what part it is. I just get to be part of it. And Father, I thank you for your son Jesus. And I thank you for the Holy Spirit that is bringing us collecting us, gathering us together to be the body, the flesh and the bone of your Son, Jesus Christ. We thank you, Father, that though we as Adam have failed, that Christ, the second Adam, never has. And we thank you, God, that as you have given us life in this body, you will give us everlasting life in the next. Father, bless and magnify your word in the hearts of those who have heard it tonight. May they be blessed in hearing it. I pray this in Jesus' name and all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. Thank you for coming.